in the FCC's International Bureau, MCI Communications, and with former Vice President Gore uh, reinventing, reinventing Government Office. Uh, she's advised governments and cor corporations around the world on IG policy, ICT policy, and others. She's also uh, chair of the at, -large the at Large Council's Technology Task Force, which has uh, done some very important work, uh, and she'll probably talk about, it, about that a little bit. Uh, and she has uh, ex ex you know, extensive experience in, in internet governance. So uh, please a hand, a hand for Judith, please. Before she starts, I remind you that to, tomorrow, please, everybody put your shirts on because we're going to have group, group pic, uh, pictures. So tomorrow, the afternoon, I think. We'll mention that further on. Thank you. So, okay. Um, so, I wanted to start off a little bit of, um, with a de definition of internet governance, lead on to the history, then on to where internet governance is today, talk about the internet governance forms, IGFs, um, and then the various stakeholders. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. okay. um, I think I may try to use this one, it might be easier. Hello. Now we have to switch to. Okay, nah, yeah, that's much better. Okay, so now I don't. So, what I also wanted to. Um, so, I, I always like to start off with a definition because uh, that way we'll come on this definition a little bit later. But um, this definition that was, as Olivier mentioned, that we talked about earlier, is basically about, about internet governance, is the development and application by governments, the private sector, and civil society in their respective roles of shared principles, norms, rules, decision-making, and programs that shape the evolution and use of the internet. Uh, and as you see from this nice handy-dandy photograph from Diplo, the, uh, the little house of internet governance it has parts for human rights, socio-cultural, economic, development, cybersecurity, infrastructure, and under construction, in the under construction sign is the different um, IT stakeholders in the list. So um, going back to the first history of internet governance, um, Olivia talked a little bit about the ITU um, every, so the first history goes back to the 1998 Planning Potentiary Conference that was held in Minneapolis. Now the Planning Potentiary Conference is the key, uh, it happens every four years and it is the main decision making policy body for the ITU. Um, it is when all the different sectors get together and they create the policy for the next four years going forward. They agree on resolutions, they agree on different other items in the list. So it's the really decision-making body, and this is why it's also very important to really get involved in the whole process. So it was here that the other countries are first pushed to have the ITU recognize the need for the private sector, civil society, and others to get involved on governance of the internet. Um, so they adopted at this conference a resolution, I think it was number 73, um, that, that f called for the creation of a World Summit on Information Society. Um, and they asked the ITU and, it was, and the council, which is the governing body of the ITU, to authorize the summit. So the conference also called for greater participation by the ITU in the evolution of the internet. Um, as I mentioned, they adopted Resolution 73, which created the World Summit of Information Society, otherwise known as WISIS, and they put forward to the UN. Now, the UN, in 2001, in December 2001, approved Resolution 56, endorsing the holding of a WISIS to discuss these information society issues. 
They also emphasize that the conveners of the WSIS use a what's called a multi-stakeholder process. So basically, it's not just governments, but it's private sectors, civil society, um, in consumer organizations, uh, academia, technical institutions, international organizations, pretty much everyone to get involved in working together. Um, at first, the IT was given the leading role to organize an event, and it did so in cooperation with other UN bodies and other international organizations. And they recommended that preparation for the summer take place through an open-ended PrepCon. And the PrepCon is basically a, uh, a group that, uh, that tries to set the modalities for what's going to happen at the conference. So they want to decide on the agenda, how, how things are going to go forward, how uh, basically how people are going to participate. And so that's basically a PrepCon. They usually have these before larger meetings. Um, in 2001, they decided that we're going to break this up into two summits. We're going to have one um, in December in Geneva, and then we'll have another one two years later in Tunis. So the, as you, the WISIS was a two-phase sponsor summit. Um, and in broad terms, it, it tried to outline some of these issues on governance, on internet, and it's one of the chief aims of, the, of people where they wanted to somehow, how are we going to bridge the digital divide that separate rich countries from poor countries? And how are we going to spread internet access and set some goals for all countries to gain um, access to the internet? And as we saw in Olivia's chart, it, it grew exponentially in the 2000s, but it was still growing. Um, and so the first visit, as I mentioned, was held in Geneva. And there were delegates from 175 countries that took part in this first phase. And these delegates were mostly government people. But there were also civil society, technical groups as well. And they adopted an action plan, which we still use today, along with a series of 11 different goals and objectives in the action plan. But the plan did not spell out how this is going to be achieved. Um, also, it left, it left unresolved many issues um, that were extremely controversial, such as governance of the internet and other areas. So after that, after that summit failed, they, didn't, they couldn't agree on internet governance terms. So they decided, OK, let's create a working group. And then let's pass this working group with this idea of first creating a definition and then creating policies and goals and other areas. So they tasked this group to work on these issues. And their main activity was to investigate and make proposals on the, uh, for governance. Um, and they were also asked to present their work at the WISIS in Tunis in 2005. So the group had about 40 different members, and they were drawn from governments, private sector, civil society. And the goal was to have everyone participate on an equal footing and get contributions from everyone and get the best um, solutions we can. So they had three objectives. One, create a definition. Two, identify the public policy issues that were relevant. And three, try to get a common understanding of the roles and responsibilities of governments, of international organizations, its private sector, its civil society, how are they all gonna work together. So they had four meetings. Um, and although they came to common understanding of what is the internet, what are the goals of the internet, they had no common understanding of the term governance. Um, and 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 as such, they didn't know, hence the mandate that WISIS gave them to develop a working definition is, was hard to reach for them. So they looked at five different criteria to, de to create a definition of internet governance. Um, so those are the criteria there. They also looked at a wide range of different governance mechanisms, both public sector, private sector, multi-stakeholder, how are we going to deal with this? And finally, 
They assessed a number of alternative definitions proposed by various parties in the course of the process. So before they could arrive at the current definition, they went through a whole series of other definitions. And then they arrived at that definition that we talked about earlier. But while this definition reinforces the concept of inclusiveness of governments, private sector, civil society, uh, international organizations, other groups, in the mechanisms of internet governance, it also acknowledges that each group has different interests and they, each group has different roles and responsibilities and sometimes these overlap. So they're very different. And there's, but within that difference, we can work together. Because um, internet governance includes more than just names and numbers. The stuff that we that I can is dealing. With. It involves a whole lot of the other areas, uh, policy areas such as critical internet resources, security and stability, um, developmental aspects, and all these issues pertain to the internet. And we still, in, although we all agree on this today, we still have many discussions on this very topic. Um, and I'm also involved in the the. CCWG that looking at the auction proceeds, and we're having these same discussions today of how do we include within the definition of ICANN, of internet governance, the developmental aspects. So these same, even though we think we solve these, these really have never been solved. And we continue having these discussions of how to make it wider. Eduardo. Can you tell us what CCWGs and oh, sorry. CCWGs is? So the cross-community cross working group, um, Olivia talked about the auctions. And Ron talked about the auctions and how they raised a certain amount of money for ICANN that was later, um, they raised more money than, they had, than was needed. And so ICANN put aside this pot of money and it was going to be this committee in a multi stakeholder fashion is deciding what to do with this pot of money. Um, and so we're still having discussions. Because in the multi stakeholder group, it takes time. It's a very messy, everyone has their own say, and then we have to work together to create an overall opinion that everyone can agree on. So. Earlier, you know, so there's many problems with these definitions. One of the uh, problems is that the term governance has many different interpretations. So I know we have speakers here, people who speak French, Spanish, Italian, uh, Romanian, and uh, Portuguese. So in Portuguese, in these, how do they translate govern? Go is there a word governance? Yes, government. It's a government. It's not what we're calling a governance. So the support, the general problem is that the term governance of the internet is translated in many languages as government. There's no real word for, gov for internet governance, what we're talking about. And that is the crux of the problem here is how do you explain to someone what governance is when there's no, lang when there's no word or translation into the language? And so that's the problem. That's one of the major issues. And the best way of doing it is showing it. Um, like I said here, in many early the process, many delegations thought that internet governance is only government, and it should only be addressed on, on intergovernmental level. And they class as a broader meeting. And even as the wishes. Even though the WISIS has been operating for many, many years, it wasn't until the renewal of the WISIS that I'll be talking about later that many people, and through going to the different internet governance forum, could see what internet governance, what is multi-stakeholder, how is it important. It's something that you have to experience to really, for other cultures to really see, ah, this is what they meant, and this is why it's important. So that's one of our major problems. And one of the main aims of the working group was to foster full participation in internet governance 
by different developing countries. So they placed a uh, aim in this work uh, in, the pri in, in setting up these priorities that would work to build capacity building in developing countries so that the developing countries could really understand what it is. And this is what led, led to the creation of the Internet Governance Forum, or IGF. Now, the IGF's mandate comes directly from paragraph 72 of the Tunis Agenda. And that mandate is to discuss public policy issues related to key elements of the Internet, of Internet governance, and to foster the sustainability, robustness, security, stability, and development of the Internet. And it does this by facilitating discourse between different bodies dealing with different classes of international organizations and different public policies regarding the Internet. And in discussing these issues does not fall to any one body. It's within, it's, it's something that everyone needs to discuss. And so it, it, it's in many different bodies. So the IGF today serves to do exactly that. It serves to bring people together from various stakeholder groups as equals in discussions on public policy issues relating to the internet. And while the IGF does not have any negotiated outcomes like a treaty or like other different groups, there's no, it's, it's a discussion forum. It's not going to come to any decision. Um, it seeks to inform and inspire policy making power in both the public and the private sector. And at the, the global IGF, delegates discuss and they exchange information, they share good best practices, um, they work to create a common understanding of how to maximize internet opportunities and address the risks and challenges. Javier. Question. What is the the legal basis under the UN, of the, of the, I mean, what's the legal basis of the Tunis agenda? Is that like a UN resolution? Yes. So, so WISIS, for, so originally the IT, the IT, the ITU, the plenipotentiary body, which is the governing body of the entire ITU, which is the four sectors, development, standards, telecom, radio. Um, they, they said, we need to create uh, a world summit. They then asked the UN to create some resolutions so that it'll be a wider, the, just the in the ITU. The General Assembly of the UN? Yes. Okay. Then the General Assembly passed a resolution to create the wishes. The wishes then created these certain outcomes. Then, as you'll see, and Next slide, uh, first two slides, two slides from here. There's another body that the UN charged with working with this. So, but first I wanted to talk about the, since I was talking about the IGFs, I wanted to talk about that um, the first IGF was really um, groundbreaking. It was, uh, it was the first time they saw, uh, they saw multi-stakeholderism in action. Um, we had everyone there, states, businesses, academic, technical community, civil society, and they all take turns on the microphone to ask the question. There's no like government side, civil society side, private sector side. Everyone lines up and it's first come, first serve who lines up. So governments don't get any priority, private sector doesn't get any priority, no one gets any priority. There have been, besides, after the first one, which was in Athens, there were 11 others. We are still waiting to hear where the IGF will be in 2018. So that's to be found out later. So the second phase of the WSIS, that's the Tunis agenda, um, they agreed on, uh, on, the, on set the stage for what these goals are and they codified all the definitions that the Working Group on Internet Governance set up, as well as creating the action line, and that's when the, the WISIS action lines were put forward, which we still use today. So they created these 11 action lines, and, each of, and then every year um, they do an update at the WISIS forum on how they're going on achieving the goals of WISIS through these action lines. So these action lines were very broad, but they're still in use today. And even today, 
the now, uh, as the UN has moved from its original Millennium Development Goals to Sustainable Development Agenda, they have all very closely mapped to all these same wishes goals that were created back in 2005. So every year, the U.S. has started what's called a stock taking process. They say, okay, so where have we, how have we done in achieving our goals and objectives in the past year? And so this is a document that is put together that all countries, governments, private sectors, businesses add to on here are some good examples of how we achieve, uh, how we're thinking we're achieving this action line. Um, and so they put together this book. And its purpose is, like I said, to register all the activities. And the ITU has been maintaining it as a publicly accessible system. And so you could Google the where's the stock taking. And its purpose is to provide regular reports or updates on the, on the action lines. Now you asked also about this, so the UN body that is really looking at um, IGF, internet governance, WISIS, and other areas is the Committee on Science and Technology and Development. CSCD was established way before, it was established in 92 by the UN's, the, uh, what's known as the ECOSOC, which is the Economic and Social Council. And they're the ones who have been working on a lot of these issues. Um, and they were charged by the UN, UN and to provide an update to the General Assembly with advice on these public policy issues and help to guide the work of future UN organizations to develop some common policies and agree on appropriate actions. So that's in general what the, their role is they need to um, update on the WISIS, update on anything related to internet governance, update on other areas. They've gotten bogged down in a lot of areas. Um, basically, they have 43 members are the member states, and they have a term of four years, but they also have private sector members, so it's not only just governments. So they have, um, 11 members from, diff from the div other members besides the state, besides the member states, they are divided up into different categories uh, for the different reasons. So the Africa, Latin America, Eastern Europe, and the Western Europe, and the other states, they all have different members. And together, they are working along on this council. Um, along with the mandate as WISIS, they also have two, uh, they have, they've had in the past two working groups. One was in, on internet governance forums, and a second on enhanced cooperation. So in 2012, they, cre they convened a working group to look at, in look at reform to the internet governance forum. Um, the internet governance forum had been going on for a while, and they wanted, a lot of people were upset that it wasn't out, there was no outcomes. They, the things that they thought could be done better, so they looked at um, how, how we can improve them, and they had five meanings. So, so these are some of the questions. How do we develop more tangible outcomes? How do we improve the visibility of the outcomes in there and the accessibility of the IGF in general? How do you improve the outreach and cooperation with other groups and other groups within the UN in, in general? How do you improve the working modalities of the IGF? Um, so you can get more people involved, open consultations, improvements to the MAG, the Secretariat. How do we improve the funding? The IGF has no funding, and so they need a way to how to improve the funding of the IGF. How do you broaden participation? How do you link the IGF to other related processes? So they had a tall agenda. Um, and they worked and they created answers to all of these. And there's still working groups on this. They're still working on these, but these, they've gradually, uh, greatly improved the IGF. We'll talk about some of these later. They also created, not as successful, a working group on enhanced cooperation. And they, under the, to, 
which is a green, which is a summit, there was a term called enhanced cooperation. And no one has able to agree on what this means. So it's the uh, states of like Iran and, and Russia and others say enhanced cooperation is only government. Others say it's not. They've had two different series of working groups to try to figure out an answer to this and show how we're doing on enhanced cooperation. Well, the first group, we had 22 members and they were divided evenly between the regions. That group met four times a year, four times, and they were supposed to report the progress in 2014. However, in 2014, they, uh, they were unable to offer any recommendations to the group. So they told the chair, we're deadlocked. We think we st there's still more to research. We don't have enough time. Can we be extended? So the chair reauthorized the group for another four years in the hopes that he would be able to come to some recommendations and conclusions. So the new group started in 2014 and ended in 2018. They met four times, they met five times over four years, and the last meeting in January, but they remain deadlock, and they still are unable to come to any conclusions. Javier. Could you explain the two positions, the two, the two, the two different views on what enhanced cooperation means? So one group says it means something, and the other group says it means what? One group is talking, saying it's only government. So in that context, government will do what? The government is government's job to um, work on aspects of of increasing increasing broadband access, increasing other things, and it's only government's doing it. While well, the other group is saying, well. It's a combined effort. You can't just only have governments. You need to all work together. The private sector has a role. Other manu other groups, other agencies have a role. Other different groups. So is the same, the same tension that Olivia was talking about between multilateralism and... Yes, exactly. Okay. And so that's... The, gov the, the governments in the, in the Russian, in the former Soviet Union, in some of the former Soviet Union, and the more totalitarian governments are saying it's only this. And the others are saying, no, you really got, we just so much change have been there. We've gone so far in eliminating the village divide. Yes, we have far to go, but we've gone so far and we need to take a broader approach. But um, for, we'll see how this comes out. Um, the, uh, the meeting ended in January and the, the report is not out yet, but it seems like it was another failure to come to a, uh, come to a unified position. Why do you think that is so? Um, it's that basically you have two players, two groups, two camps, that are just digging in the heels. And they're just playing politics, and it's not going to get resolved unless some horse trading is done. And no one wants, they, they don't want to budge. Want to budge. Um, they were close, and you know, maybe possibly the thought was if there was more time, they can work on some of the smaller countries to get over and go with them and work on more convincing others. So it just, ran out of time in these negotiations they are very hotly debated and there's things have to be given and taken and it just uh, you'd be surprised at how much discussion there is on something that um, like for instance at the plenty potentially four years ago I was in a meeting we had a three hour discussion on whether to remove the words telex from the resolution Wow. But isn't there some mechanism? So no. Is there no mechanism to ensure that you, you, you if you have common goals, um, because it should, there should be more structure. Uh, maybe I'm just too much of a lawyer, and and that's important that you have some structure because if you, if you, if you meet, there should be some meeting of mind somewhere along the line. Because how do you carry on a perpetuated process that's never going to be decisive? But that, uh, what are the effects of that on, on internet governance in itself? 
Well, so that's also the difference is, but luckily, these issues of enhanced cooperation and the split did not, when we did, I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, the, the wishes plus 10 review, it did not hamper it. So although no one could come to an agreement and they were still discussing this, even in 2015 when they had the 10 year review, luckily these issues were not, um, did not come to a head and did not um, convince the governments that they cannot continue with the wishes. So back in 2005, in the two things they said, oh in 10 years we're gonna reassess how the wishes is doing. So, 2015, 10 years after the WISIS, the, um, they had an implementation. They want to look at how, how, these, how well has the implementation has gone. So they, they set up a series of stock taking um, with series of meetings ending up in a high level meeting at the UN General Assembly in December. And in December 2015, the UN General Assembly reviewed whether sufficient progress has been made to achieving WSIS goals over the past 10 years, and they also decided the future of the WSIS. Um, so they, review, they reviewed the progress made in implementation, and they provided vision forward in the post-2015 WSIS agenda. Um, and the discussion focused on the benefits and the challenges of a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, so what it is is that each group, each of these UN, so there was the um, ITU, UNESCO, other different UN bodies who had roles in the WSIS, um, each had their own series of stock taking exercises. So they each had their own public forums and they each then assessed what were the outcomes and what progress has been made and what are, what are the challenges ahead. And they came together to look at these issues and they created an outcome document. So this outcome document for the ITU was sent to UNESCO, was sent to the um, General Assembly. The outcome document from the conversations UNESCO was having with its representatives and its stakeholders on the WSIS was also sent to the General Assembly all the bodies sent them to the General Assembly. And the General Assembly, um, they had two leaders in charge. Um, from Latvia, and I forgot where the other one was from, this escapes me a moment. And they were leading the whole process. And so there was a lot of work to educate them. Um, and the CSED also had their own stock taking, and they did their own forms with public, multi-stakeholder, and people submitted comments and they wrote their own, they wrote their own um, outcome document and they sent that all up to the General Assembly. So everyone's sending their, their, their the outcome documents to the General Assembly of, this is our belief and we've talked to all our stakeholders. This is the progress that has been made. And so the General Assembly had all this information when it was making its decision. Um, and this is what I just discussed on, we'll get the slides afterwards, you can look at that. And so these, each of these, on the web is each of these, you can read um, each of these outcome documents and all the work that was done from each of those. So they, all, they were all collected and they then were given to the UN, to the UNCA, which is the UN General Assembly. And that whole, this whole process of of, of all these different UNAC doing the reviews is what's called as the WISIS plus 10 process. Because WISIS is 20, 2005, plus 10 is 2015. So, so they're saying WISIS plus 10. Um, Can you repeat that, the plus 10? Okay, so, so since the WISIS was in 2005, um, they were doing a 10 year review. So instead of saying, 2015 is wishes plus 10. So 2005 plus 10 is 2015. And, and then it's the wishes plus 10, the agenda, the post agenda, you know, so they don't, 
they categorize things as like not by dates but like by events. So when the UN did its goals, the sustainable is to post an agenda, you know. So they 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 do everything pre and post. Um, but one of the successes of this WISIS plus 10 was that the outcome document shows that there is no longer a different, an issue of internet governance. Governments are now understanding that what it is to be multi-stakeholder. Many of the governments now understand, yes, they understand the difference, multilateral and multi-stakeholder. Although they do think some of the other governments still think that it should be multilateral, but they understand, they think, oh, well, governments and others coming together is multi-stakeholder, but the, they kind of, they more in sense understand what it is to be multi-stakeholder. They may not agree with it, but they more understand. So the WISIS plus 10 recognized the internet, this is a quote from the document, as a global facility that includes multilateral, transparent, democratic, and multi-stakeholder processes with the full involvement of governments, the private sector, the civil society, international organizations, technical and academic communities. And this is an evolution from the 2005 Tunis Agenda, which used the terms international management of the internet and was specific that it should be multilateral, transparent, and democratic. So now we've really grew into a better understanding of what the internet. Javier? So who, for that de in that definition, did countries voted for that definition? Right. So China voted for that definition? Well, I don't know who what the actual choice is. It? So they... So they, it's a voting record of that. Be so yeah, so if you look in, they they uh, an outcome document from the UNJA on that. And this is what was in the document as the agreed upon <coughs> definition. But it's, it's an actual voting, not like a, not a, not a sign of consensus. Um, no, it's not voting. Oh, what? Okay. It's, it's, it's a consensus. Okay, so in that, they're not voting voting. It's that they're not taking, they're not saying we refuse to do it. We refuse this definition. If one country refused, would it go through? I think it might go through, but there would be rejections. But there wasn't really on that. Um, there was a lot. There was a huge amount of work that was done in trying to prepare these uh, countries for this. You had a question? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm the same like. Uh, it, it, it meant. It means that uh, they they recognize. They all recognize uh, that it's stakeholder even though they don't like it. Right, and they recognize, yes, and they do recognize them after they wouldn't process it. So they wouldn't agree for it and they'll still fight on the issues, but they'll recognize that, yes, they may still think, oh, well, that issue could be multi-stakeholder, but this other issue can't be made a multi-stakeholder. So they have their battles. So while they agree to something, that, oh, open consultations and while we have this, they'll fight to the death of, oh, well, that's this item, but this item is different, and we don't agree with that item. So they change their minds all the time. It's because they may have traded something to get that opinion, and so they have to support that because they, trade, they did a political trade. You support this, I'll support that, but they don't really agree. Uh, Okay, so now we'll go back here. Next one. So, now we also, as we mentioned in 2003, in the beginning of the process, most countries addressed internet governance issues. They did it through telecom ministries and regulatory authorities, which meant the ITU, and the ITU was only governments. However, the growing impact of the internet on the political, social, economic, and fabric of society leads to other government departments. So now you have so many other different agencies involved in internet issues, because internet touches everything. So UNESCO is very heavily involved, and the social and cultural. A lot of other agencies are all involved, and they all come to the IGF, they're all getting involved with it. So they all see that we need to really do this work together 
to to because we all have a part in it. Um, and today, the groups working on internet governance are very diverse. Even the government agencies are very diverse. It's not just the telecom ministry. You have many different other ministries. You have the housing. All the stuff are work are concerned about internet issues. Um, and the IGF has grown. So now. There are national IGFs in over 70 countries. So this is smaller, like we have a global IGF and there's a national IGF, so different countries have the national IGF. Or there are 17 sub-regional or regional IGF. There are nine youth IGFs. And they're all organized on national or regional levels. And here's a map showing these are the accepted according to the IGF government body of the national or regional IGFs. Um, I'm glad I know your question. The question is, the be accepted... <laughs> the question, you, he's harped on this many times. The question is, to be classified as a regional IGF, you have to, you can charge a fee to come in. You can't, you have to be open to everyone. You have to have many different stakeholders involved. Um, so this is a definition of that. They are independent groups of people that have come together to discuss issues pertaining to internet governance from the perspective of their respective communities. And they all have shared objectives of adhering to the core values of the IGF and contributing to internet governance related issues nationally, regionally, and globally. The youth IGFs have different elements. They are specifically organized forums that discuss issues pertaining to the internet from the youth point of view. But all these IGFs are required to support the main IGF criteria, and, and only those are recognized and listed on the IGF website and on the, the map that uh, is done. You'll hear later Anya Genko, who is the staff person in charge of all national regional initiatives from the IGF, which include the youth IGF. Um, and so the shows come later and you'll hear a discussion from her. Um, so as a result of the review process, the UNCA then reauthorized the IGF for 10 years. Now this reauthorization was a great, important um, benefit and something that was worked hard. It was thought that the countries who were opposed to enhanced cooperation would scuttle this 10 year author reauthorization, but luckily they didn't. Um, there, was enough, there was enough movement by other countries to saying, yes, we like the IGF, we want to talk, a space to talk, we want to continue for 10 years. Pre previously, they had three or five year mandates and it's hard to get a focus of a group when every year you're trying to figure out are we going to be authorized the next year? And it's even harder when they're trying to raise funds. So many of the countries use national IGFs as a way to engage various stakeholder groups and say, oh, we engage the various stakeholder groups. May they not have, but we talk to them. We may not listen to them, but we still talk to them. Um, so the IGF created dynamic coalitions. Another improvement of the IGF was to create dynamic coalitions. And they were a way to continue the discussion on a variety of topics throughout the year. The concept was first when they had a meeting in the first meeting, there was a number of coalitions that were established themselves at that time and they wanted a way to have informal issue specific groups to continue discussions on different areas. There's a number of one, uh, as Matt knows, there's a dynamic coalition on com connectivity and community networks. So there's a lot of any little group that can get together and they can share best practices, ways of connecting, ways of talking. There's another one, accessibility, there's hundreds of them. Not hundreds, but there's a lot of them. Um, once established, these dynamic coalitions have three basic rules. They need to be inclusive and transparent. They need to have, that means they need to have an open membership, open mailing list, and open archives. They must also ensure that their statements and outputs ref reflect both 
majority, minority, and any dissenting opinions. So and a lot of these were in response to the work that the CSCD had done on enhancement to the IGF. Um, and the, they also, the IGF, one of these other enhancements was to create a series of intercessional activities. So the IGF only meets once a year, but there are some, they want to continue talking these topics all year long. And so they created the IGF intercessional work. This main body now is focusing on connecting and enabling the next billion. So uh, since 2015, there have been three phases of this work. Um, and three different reports. In 2015, it was the report was called Connecting and Enabling the Next Billion. They took inputs from all, all stakeholders, were invited to submit their inputs, and then there was a team of volunteers or working together to create the report. The next year, they decided to focus on policy options for connecting the next billion. And then the, on the third year, they continued along this theme in doing that. And here's the link to where all these reports can be found. Another series of improvements that were done were to create best practice forms. Now these best practice forms, they're not using the term best as in this is the optimal or only solution. It says this is a way where we want to figure out what topics each year are most important and have some kind of discussions. So they offer a, a way to have produce more concrete outcomes. They also have the freedom to find their own methodologies and tailor to each theme. And each year the MAG defines on different ones. So the first year they had uh, cybersecurity, gender, internet exchange points, um, IPv6, uh, cybersecurity. And the next year they focused on cybersecurity still, but gender, the new one was gender and access and one on local content. So they're all trying different things all the time. So as you see, multi-stakeholderism is this like, type of governance structure that brings together all stakeholders to participate in a dialogue and decision making and the implementation of solutions to, to common problems or goals. And a stakeholder is really anyone, an individual, a group, organization, anyone who has a direct or indirect or some kind of stake in the outcome. And so it could be an individual, it could be consumer groups, it could be businesses, civil society, research institutions, non-government, it could be anyone. Um, and the principle behind this is what, is that if there's enough input, we can get consensus. So if we look at all the different, various different points of, of discussion and what people put in, we can arrive at, people can agree on some common ideas as long as we get enough input. And that the decision will gain more le legitimacy because it represents more people. And each one can find their own um, solution or, or problem or answer in that question. And so therefore it reflects a better idea of what we we're looking for. Um, the stakeholders are here. There's technical groups and that's the ISTAR organizations which are ISAC, IANA, IETF. The W3C is the uh, World Wide Web Consortium. Um, IEEE, which is the, the standards. I can the domain, which is what we were talking about, IAB, the Internet Architecture Board, RIRs, the Regional Internet Registries, ASOs, NROs, governments and international organizations are like the UN or different organ, organs of the UN like ITU, UNESCO, the CSED, which is part of the UN um, so, Committee of Technology and I forgot what it stands for. And the Council OECD, the other group, and Council of Europe. They're very active. And the pri private sector is the International Chamber of Commerce, different Chamber of Commerce, the World Economic Forum, um, computing associations, or private sector companies, Apple, Google, Amazon, nonprofits, other, you know, some other groups. Civil society, you have a whole bunch of um, 
very active civil society groups, Public Knowledge, Access Now, Article 19, Electronic Frontier Foundation. There's um, a coalition of internet governance forms. So there's a coalition of smaller uh, internet governance organizations under the rubric of the IGC, the Internet Governance Co Coordination. Um, Best Bits is another conglomeration of smaller nonprofits. Of course, I can at large and the NCSG, academia and the consumer group. So as you can see here, all, again, a summation of what we discussed. Um, it's going to be available to everyone and I take any other questions that people might have. <coughs> um, you, Glenn wants to go first. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know you, you stated that they didn't identify this year's form. Any hint of what the, the theme will be this year? Well, we have to figure out where it's going to be and we're hoping that at the MAG, which is the ruling body, of the, I, of the IGF um, will come to some answer when they meet in March. The MAG is a multi-advisory group, multi-sector advisory group. They're the ruling body of the IGF. And I think, Glenn, that might be the perfect question to ask Anya Genko when she comes and give her talk, because she'll be more on the pulse of things working for the IGF. The reason I'm bringing it up, because anyone can submit a proposal. Not right, all the so, so all countries, any country can agree to host the IGF. Um, and there's certain UN rules that need to be followed, but any country, but countries have not stepped up to the plate. Um, Switzerland did it. it. Was supposed to be 2018, but they did in 2017. Now, um, you yes. yes. I want to ask something, but if if you want more information, uh, definitely go to IGF. But IGF USA, uh, their their event is somewhere around March. No, IGF. You, no, IGF. You, USA. No, no. It's July. It's July. The survey is out oh, in March. It's in March. Um, Olivier? Yeah, you, you were asking about Mises plus 10 and what was the outcome of it all. So that the whole review took place, it took months and months and months. Then this was moved over to the UN General Assembly. The UN General Assembly met for two days and took statements from, and I, I was just reading this because I didn't quite remember yeah. how crazy the whole thing was. Did okay. I that? Yeah, how crazy the whole thing was. Yeah. So they had 10 representatives of non-governmental organizations. 25 member states and a sizable contingent of United Nations entities, including the ITU, the International right. Communications Union. They all came out with statements and whatever, which all showed their results or their thinking about the thesis plus technologies, and some of the statements being diametrically opposed with each other, which therefore got the whole assembly to say that's really great, so now we're going to have a vote. If does anybody require a vote on this to adopt a resolution, then there's no consensus. And of course, everybody agreed that there was no consensus, so there was no vote, and therefore the session was lifted and everybody was happy and said, excellent. Our recommendations are for the work to continue, for more committees to create themselves, for this issue to be sent over to the CSTD, which you had uh, mentioned. Never mind the failure of the CSTD to find a solution. <laughs> Send it back to the CSTD, get some new chairs appointed, Get all of you people back on track and see you again next year or the year after, depending on how long it will take. Right, so basically, uh, to rephrase the question for the video is, uh, uh, he talked about, yes, all these, they had statements by governments, by others, they all gave their talk on what they thought was going to be internet governance and what was success of WISP plus 10, and they said, yes, great work, great outcomes, we need to keep discussing. So because there's no consensus, so keep on talking about what you're talking about. Yes, keep <laughs> okay, um, so I work with Indigenous Assembly and PSA Youth Summit. One of the things that I've been uh, as a UN Youth Representative for o over a year now, and one of the things that I noticed, and obviously you guys are well versed on this, and I'm asking you guys, um, I see from the older generation that lots of time, <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's divided. The UN is not divided because there's a new generation coming. And what we see is a lot of talk. And 
I guess because um, the youth and uh, like the group that I work uh, usually are in university, we have to stick to a schedule in the meetings and actually make things work. One of the things that I've noticed is that when they do all these general assemblies, is yeah, is that usually or is it get closer? Okay, so one of the things that happens is you even mentioned that like one of them was of, like excessive amounts of hours and no one actually came to like a resolution of the situation. I don't think it's because of time. I think because from what I've experienced so far in the UN is that things are being talked, numbers are being thrown, and there's really no, um, you know, actual action from many different organizations. Exactly. So as a youth, it's quite disconcerting, and this is why there's a divide. And I'm asking you guys, especially, to have a lot of, you know, information because I'm trying to convince the older generation that we actually have to make things work for the upcoming generation. How do you guys bypass that system? Thanks so much for your discussion. Um, when I said time, basically the time is for governments to work together and do some horse training. <laughs> and that is, takes time. So they, like for instance in the planning part, a lot of things were just, things were came, solution, things got, for instance in the planning part we got the, uh, several of the countries who were against openness and transparency and open consultations to agree to do them but it was only because something else was traded. So when you say time, time is on diplomacy is we need time to convince other countries of this. We need something to horse trade. We need to figure out what can we do. Time is that. Um, they may not agree, so they'll agree with open consultations and they'll say, oh wow, we now have a full panoply, but we still want the whole thing. Olivier? It's signed with parliamentary procedures. So, and this is a person of the UN that told me this. So, uh, uh, WCIT week 12, that took place in July, I was on the UK delegation. The first thing that our head of delegation, who the guy that's done like kind of 20 years of UN negotiations, was, remember everyone, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Which means that sessions can go on and on and on, and if the chair feels like it can stay another couple of hours up, the session can move at midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, and that's when the action will take place, because that's when people are tired, they just want to go home, they're on their tenth coffee, they, 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 you know, they, they can't think well anymore, and somebody manages to sneak something into the resolution which everyone else doesn't see, and suddenly, because the countries that were against the resolution were so tired and thought, you know what, we're just going home. Suddenly, ah, let's get a vote done. And this is actually what happened in a couple of uh, times when a vote was called at the very last minute when half the people had already left the room because they thought, That's not, nothing's going to happen now. So first thing, filibustering. Filibustering is when you start taking the mic and you go on and on and on, a bit like what I'm doing, but and on and on and on, <laughs> all day, so as to stop any meaningful debate from actually taking place. Are you going to read Dr. Seuss? They, well, because you're talking about the United Nations, unfortunately, no country can stop from speaking. And this is what happened, actually, I think it was Lydia that took the floor of the United Nations and went on for I don't know how many hours talking about how great their, you know, their, their flowers were and I don't know what, all sorts of stories. Come and visit Libya, you know, beautiful tourism and all that. You can't stop a country from speaking, so just keep on talking. And that's one of the things that they use at the General Assembly, one of the things that they use at weekends, you know, at, at other uh, UN processes. It's not something that you use in other uh, multi-stakeholder uh, discussions, and often, in fact, there's a timer which goes ding and basically kicks you off um, from the thing. So first problem.